Greetings, folks, and, uh, and welcome back. Today, I'd like to talk a bit about semantic changes in Middle English. That is, words that survived into Middle English from Old English, and yet, in one way or another, changed their meanings or had their meanings changed. So what we're going to do now is just run through some ways in which words change meanings and take a look at a few examples from Old English and how and maybe why they changed the way they did in the Middle English period. Next week, probably we'll get into a bit of grammar, but as we were talking so much about words last time, that's kind of where I think we should go now just to keep that theme consistent, I guess. In any case, I hope you find it interesting. Many of these changes are paired up, so a word can move in one of two directions along a particular axis. So, for example, we have generalization and narrowing. That is, a word can become either more broad or more focused in its application. Or maybe more specific is, is a better term to use for narrowing. In any case, these terms are pretty easy to get your minds around. And, and, and I think now we'll take a look at some examples. And honestly, they won't give you any trouble. Let's start with generalization. So we'll, we'll take a look at the old English word brid, which becomes in Middle English bird, which is bird in, in modern English. Now, in old English, brid meant young bird. Whereas in Middle English, it comes to be simply bird, the general meaning. And the reason for this is that the Old English word fugel, meaning bird or fowl, came to be narrowed in the Middle English period to mean bigger edible birds. So barnyard fowl, for example, um, chickens, ducks, geese. These, these were common, common barnyard birds in, in the Middle Ages. Or why don't we take a look at Old English Ruch, rough, coarse, hairy, shaggy. This is a textile word. It refers to cloth, fabric. But to say in Old English that, that a stone was rough or that someone's skin was rough or ruch, it would make no sense whatsoever. So here's a case where the meaning has become broader. The general sense of it is the same. And usually if you take a look at how these words work, you can follow the logic of the transformation. Sometimes it can be a little surprising, but it's always there. For example, Old English grund, which becomes ground in Middle English and ground in Modern English, meant something very different in Old English than it does now. It is where we get our word ground, of course. When we talk about ground in Modern English or when, when Middle English speakers spoke about ground, they would have been speaking of that stuff we walk on, that stuff that we like to be solid when we stand on it, either literally or metaphorically. In Old English, Grund referred specifically to the ground at the bottom of a body of water, for example, at the bottom of a pond or something like that. And in fact, it's hypothesized that Grund is the etymology, or at least a possible etymology, for the name of Grendel, the monster in Beowulf, who of course emerges from, uh, from a mirror, from, from, uh, from both a subterranean and, and, and submarine environment. With narrowing, on the other hand, we are moving in the exact opposite direction. In Old English, goma meant jaw, palate, the inside of one's mouth. But in Middle English, goma simply means gum, as in your gums. That's where we get our word. And the reason here is, and this will often be the case, a Latin replacement. That is, Latin at palate now refers to the top of the mouth, and jaw of unknown origin refers to what we, of course, call the jaw, the, the movable bit. This loss of, or this reduction of the semantic field of goma basically leaves a smaller area of applicability for which the word goma, gum, is still useful. So basically, this is a case of language contact. Now, with Old English sand, meaning sand or shore, by Middle English, sand simply refers to the particles on the beach, so chunks of sand as we think of it. And the reason there is that the low German word, shore, 
comes to be used in modern English in the sense that we now use the word. So basically, sand got crowded out by a competitor. Now, feather, we spoke about before. Feather in Old English meant wing. But the contemporary use of feather, and this is also the Middle English use, is simply plumage, the, the feathers on the bird. And the reason here is Old Norse, the contact with Old Norse, as we talked about before last week, I believe, where we imported, or rather, where the word wing came to be what feather was, and there was no need to have two precise synonyms, so feather's meaning simply was reduced. Another one that's kind of interesting is freo in Old English, which meant free or noble. And the reason for this change is, again, contact with French. In Middle English, fre simply means free as how we intend it in modern English, not enslaved, not indentured, that kind of thing. And the reason specifically is that noble comes from French. What use does a French-speaking nobility have for an English word to describe what they are? So this is, a, this is one of those cases where the, the upper levels of society and therefore the, what we might call the high culture words in the language, become French. But of course, the distinction between free and slave or free and bond, somebody who is bonded to the land legally and someone who is not, is still an important distinction to the non-noble class. And this is another thing I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again. Anytime we see a change in a word, there's going to be some pragmatic reason for it somewhere. Language is whatever else it may be. It is pragmatic. Even when it's weird, it's still pragmatic. And that's generalization and narrowing. Now it's time to move on to amelioration and pejoration, our next pair. Amelioration is simply a word taking on a more positive meaning or connotation. That is, it is ameliorated. It is made better. Pejoration, on the other hand, is a word taking on a more negative meaning, either denotatively or connotatively. So it becomes, in some sense, a pejorative. It moves down the social scale, we could say. So let's take a look at a few examples and see how some of the Old English words adapted to life under Norman rule. Now, where amelioration is concerned, this is uncommon for Old English words. Doesn't happen very often at all. One example is the Old English word dizzy, meaning in Old English foolish or stupid. In Middle English, it comes to mean basically what we mean now in Modern English. Although it also in recent decades, has begun to turn back towards that old meaning in slang. If we say someone's dizzy in that sense, we mean they're not very bright. Why do you suppose that is? And there, of course, is a, is a reason that presents itself, a fairly straightforward reason, and that is for, for most of the words in English, French, of course, has words that do those jobs too. So where the two come into contact given the relative statuses of French and English, especially during the early Middle English period, if there's going to be movement in English, it is more likely to move down than up because socially at this point, English was a downwardly mobile language and French was an upwardly mo mobile language. And we were talking about this in the last lecture, actually, a little as well, why, why it's more polite to defecate than it is to shit. Pooping is more polite if it's done in a Latinate language than if it's done in a Germanic one. Same reason the Latinate languages still have a sense of status in our, our cultural assumptions. As I was saying last time, even a thousand years after those politics. Now, when we take a look at pejoration, we have so much more to choose from. So let's just take a look at a few. The Old English word cheryl becomes in Middle English carl. Now, in Old English, cheryl is simply a man. That's all it is, a man who is not noble. 
In the Anglo-Saxon society, there were basically two levels, the earls and the chertles, the nobles and the non-nobles. But in Middle English, Carl, which of course is where we get our word, our name, Carl, is, is something else. It takes on not just a meaning of being of non-noble birth, a man of non-noble birth. That's what, what the word means in Old English. It also takes on a sense of being churlish, that is, rude, a bit of a bore, uncivilized, uncultivated. And the reason for this is not too hard to find either. It's very similar to what we were just discussing on the last slide. The Because the nobility in England after the Norman Conquest was so isolated from the, uh, from, from the peasantry, there was no organic connection between them, as there had been under Anglo-Saxon rule. The Anglo-Saxon peasants and the Anglo-Saxon nobility were all of the same people. Well, this was no longer true in in Norman England. And if you read the literature of, of the period coming out of France, you get a sense, and this is not borne out as strongly in English, by the way, that the nobles are of a different order of being. They're a different kind of people. There's a sense of, of necessary separation, that they're not just better off and not just better at certain things, but they are better. They are, well, as, as the slang term among the serving class went sometimes in England, they're the quality. Um, this is far more deeply embedded in, in French nobility than it is in English nobility, even though the English nobility could sometimes be bastards. So words associated with simply socioeconomic difference in Old English would become associated with both socio socioeconomic and moral difference under the authority of the Norman French. Another example of pejoration is the Old English word crafty, which is just crafty. In Old English, it means strong, skillful, clever, but comes to mean more like sly and tricky in Middle English. And the reason here is very similar to the reason for the demotion of, of Chattel to Carl. That is what may seem, I guess, clever to a member of an underclass is going to seem sly and tricky to a member of the class that is lording it over them. And this is, this is something fairly interesting, actually. It's, it's very often those in power who influence the way words go. They influence the prestige, for example, that certain words have. So certain standards come to be invoked, even in the language of the underclass, or even in the thoughts, thought systems of the underclass, that are mediated by the overclass. This happens, by the way, in, um, in lots of other situations, in relations between men and women, for example, in a patriarchal society. The standard is assumed to be the masculine. The standard in Norman England, the thing to aspire to, was the Norman French, not the Anglo-Saxon. So as I said, if, if a word is going to change meaning up or down in that sense, it's far, far, far more likely to go down. Or take a look at, uh, at Old English yasali, which becomes in early Middle English silly, but it means blessed, which is still the same meaning that it had in, in Old English. But by late Middle English means weak, and by early Modern English means feeble-minded. So this is one that's constantly in, in flux. And of course, in modern English, in contemporary English, it can mean kind of like goofy, not serious, playful. So words move all over the place all the time. This, by the way, is one of the things that can make understanding something like even Chaucer, whose Middle English is about the easiest you'll ever find, challenging. Because many of the words look like words we use, but the meaning could be different in either subtle or really not so subtle ways. So you've got to be careful. Sometimes a similarity can be something of a false friend. Our next pair is strengthening and weakening. This, again, is fairly straightforward. Sometimes a word takes on a stronger meaning or connotation, or sometimes it takes on a weaker meaning or connotation. 
That is, it can become more robust or less robust if you want to look at it that way. The thing that it refers to can be more forceful or less forceful. I could keep doing this all day, but I think probably it's time to move on to the next slide and take a look at a few examples. Again, this is pretty straightforward stuff, but it's also not really covered that thoroughly in your textbooks, so I thought it was worth talking about today. Now, if we want to take a look at these, strengthening is easy. It pretty much didn't happen. Um, <laughs> for Again, for the same reasons we've been discussing, the, the relative statuses of English and French, especially during the early Middle Age, Ages, were so, so distinct. And this was such a class-conscious society that the likelihood of any old English word moving up the social register was not zero. It happened occasionally, but very, very, very uncommon. On the other hand, we can take a look at weakening. So Old English aya, which is related to Old Norse agi, that is terror or dread, becomes simply in Middle English a or awa, meaning wonder, which is how we tend to use it now. To, so to be in aya or agi of something in the Old English period, you were terrified. But to be in in awe of something from the Middle English period forward, you were not necessarily terrified, but maybe agape, really impressed, maybe even a bit dumbfounded, but the element of fear is no longer present. Our next pair, and these aren't tough, are they, is abstraction and concretization. And abstraction is simply where a relatively concrete word takes on a more abstract meaning and Concretization is a relatively abstract word taking on a more concrete meaning. And before we move on to the next slide to look at examples, maybe I'd like you to just pause and try to predict which of these two is more likely to be more common as we move from Old English to Middle English, given the conversation we've been having so far. The following silence is just me giving you time to think. Okay, do you have your guess in mind? Let's see how you did. If you guessed that abstraction was less common than concretization, you were right. And I suspect that that probably was what you guessed. And the reason, of course, is that the language of abstraction tended to be French. That is the language of abstract discussion, the, the language of discussing things that you didn't have to do with your hands, but things that you did with your mind tended to be French or Latin, but in any case, not English. English was the language of people who worked with their hands. And as for abstraction itself, as for abstract words, just a quick mental check of your own lexicon will tell you that most of the abstract words in modern English come from French. In fact, my French is not great. I, I can read it reasonably well. My, my spoken French is, is horrible. But I actually have an easier time, a much easier time, reading an academic article in French than I do reading a newspaper in French. And this may seem counterintuitive because, of course, newspapers don't pitch as high as academic articles. They, they write for a very basic level. But so many of the words that English-speaking academics use come out of French that, that the, uh, the content vocabulary is, in many cases, if not the same, close enough that you can make a fairly good guess most of the time. But, okay, getting back to the matter at hand, let's take a look at, uh, at the Old English knowledge, recognition, acknowledgement, or confession becoming in Middle English knowledge, which means the same thing as modern English knowledge. That is, we're moving away from that, that immediate sense of that aha of recognition or that mm-hmm of acknowledgement or that mm-hmm of confession to simply this abstract knowing in itself, this thing you know. It's, it's more distant 
knowledge is not the same as knowledge. Knowledge is more experiential, whereas whereas not whereas knowledge is is disembodied. Now, when we look at concretization, take a look at the old English wa, which is the word woe, an interjection meaning alas, or a noun meaning misery. In in Middle English, wa becomes a specific misfortune. So, and we still have it. We still have an archaic usage of that in modern English. Tell me your woes. Tell me the things that are wrong with you, the specific things. So not your general sense of regret or, or misery or catastrophe, but the concrete details that are plaguing you, bothering you, repressing you, etc. Of course, words can also change connotation. That is, their suggestions, their associations can change. They can move up or down. They can be broadened or narrowed. While the actual denotative meaning remains more or less the same. And they can also change denotation. They can denote, point towards, specifically stand for different things. And we'll talk about denotation in a moment. As for connotation, and as you can probably guess, if the connotation of an Old English word was going to change in Middle English, it would tend to move downward for reasons that by now I simply don't need to repeat. You know them. So let's take a look at the Old English word smirwan, meaning to anoint or solve or smear. In Middle English, smirian tended to point more toward smear than anoint. Now, an Old English priest might anoint someone with oil, might smear someone with oil, and it's perfectly fine. It's just an anointing. But if a Middle English priest was smearing oil, that would be a lot less dignified. So the messy element, the sloppy element, the uncivilized element continues to be used, but the more high culture element, the more refined element drops away so that it suggests sloppiness in Middle English, whereas it did not suggest sloppiness in Old English. Another example of changed connotations, and this isn't necessarily downward, is the word bur, which simply meant dwelling place or bedroom. In Middle English, bor is bower. It has poetic and sometimes erotic connotations as well, but is no longer a general dwelling place. It, it's got that specific poetic, and as I said, sometimes erotic connotation that in Old English, it simply did not have. Now, as for changes in denotation, this is simply when um, either a subsidiary or extended meaning, something other than the primary meaning of the word, becomes its new primary meaning. So the old meaning is displaced by something that is, broadly speaking, related to it, connected to the word, but peripheral in a sense. And the, that periphery moves to the center of the understanding of the word. These changes are quite common. So let's take a look at Old English teed, meaning time. In Middle English, teed becomes the tide, as in the regular movement of the water in relation to the moon. And the, this sense was sort of present in Old English. But what happens here is that the, the element of regularity of the tides, of of timing things by the tides. Now, this is a seafaring culture largely, a lot of fisher folk. So really, tides are more important than ours. And, and anybody who has fisher people in their families will recognize that you may not be able to run on a 24-hour day because you've got to control where your boat is relative to the tide. There are times to put out and there are times to put in. And this has nothing to do with the clock and everything to do with the level of the water. So telling time by the tide for seafaring people makes more sense than telling time by the sun. Now, our next word is knicht, which is pronounced exactly the same in, in Old English and Middle English. But in Old English, it means boy. But in Middle English, 
comes to mean what we think as the knight in shining armor, the the noble. Uh, this is the knight is the lowest of the noble classes, and part of this is due for due to the acquisition of the word boy, and very much like jaw, we don't know where it came from. I'm curious about a number of these very common words whose roots we don't know. How many pockets of language have we simply missed because they were never written down? I don't know. But in any case, the uh, the displacement of knicht by boy freed the word up. And it sort of makes sense as well, if you think about it, if the knight is, you could, you could say, the most junior rank of the nobility having a word that meant boy, once it was no longer required for that job, become associated with that lower tier of nobility, that junior tier of nobility, does make some sense, doesn't it? Now, as for warp or throw, moving to warp or twist, twist out of shape, we've spoken about this already. It seems to be a reference to the throwing of a net and the shape that a net takes in the air when it is thrown prior to landing on, well, usually the water. So this is, this is actually kind of poetic, and I quite like it for that reason. There is, by the way, poetry in, in, in many words that we simply become accustomed to and therefore miss. If you think of where they come from and what they're referring to, many, many words that we now have as abstracts, for example, become, come from very concrete roots. So Looking for the poetry in, uh, in, in words is something that I, was, I would always encourage you to do. Another shift involving a word we still use is a change in the meaning of the word quick, which in Old English means alive, but by Middle English comes to mean fast, although we still do have an archaic usage of it, meaning alive. We have the fossilized expression, the quick and the dead, for example. But we also have, um, if you think about your fingernails, the quick of your fingernail is, is the part that's still alive. So as a noun, we still have quick referring to alive, but not so much as an adjective in common use. And the use of it as being the live part of your fingernail, basically, or the part, the live part under your fingernail is, is much, much, much reduced from its its original sense in old english or it's sorry it's it's older sense in old english because of course it's from proto-germanic itself another example is wan originally dark and dusky which goes through basically reversal it comes to be pale but the common thread and i said there's always a through line of some kind it is the lack of hue the lack of color so that is wan refers to a shade in Old English, the shade is dark, and in Middle English, the shade is light. But in neither case is it really a color. And finally, why don't we take a look at the Old English word grannian, meaning to grimace or gnash one's teeth or draw back one's lips. In Middle English, this takes on the meaning of smiling, but it still has a kind of a threatening element to it. A grin in Middle English is, is forced or unnatural. An example, my favorite example actually, occurs in, in part one of the wonderful poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, where the knight comes in and after his challenge to the court, and I won't get into the details there because this isn't a literary course, gets his head cut off and then picks his head up and his disembodied head speaks a further challenge to the court. And the next line the next line tells us that Arthur and Gowan grin. And that is not a situation in which you just have a big happy smile. There's, there's tension in the grin. And that Middle English grin is not the modern English grin. It has the sense more, again, of the bearing, the bearing of teeth. Think of, huh, think of an animal. Think of a dog or a wolf pulling its teeth back in preparation to bite, getting, getting the teeth ready. That's, that's what a grin is. It's, it's a physiological response to stress, really. And if you ever find yourself reading a Norse saga, and you should, when Vikings grin, run, because things are probably going to get messy. But in modern English, those original denotations are completely gone. 
and a grin now for us is like a broad, happy smile. The idea of a grin being forced or hostile seems a little odd. So it's completely changed its connotations and the denotation also is quite, quite different from its root granian, which is, is, is a very stressed, very tense drawing back of the lips and baring of teeth involving even perhaps pain or, or fear or rage. So as I said earlier on a few slides ago, even where words look familiar, that familiarity can often be deceptive. A knight is just a boy in Old English. A grin is dangerous. And that seems to be about it for today's lecture. I, I get the impression that it might be a little on the short side. As I've said to you before, I record for each slide separately and then piece them together, and there's always stuff I need to cut. So I don't know how long this lecture is going to end up being or is going to end up having been by the time you reach this point. But I also don't want to shortchange you, so what I think I'm also going to do, and this is something I always do in the live class when we have the uh, the ability to meet face-to-face, -face, is is do a bit of reading of early Middle English just to give you a sense of how that language feels, uh, or how at least parts of that language feel, as we did with The Wanderer a couple of weeks ago. So look for that one soon. And in the meantime, continue your reading into the second Middle English chapter in the textbook. And we will continue to explore that wonderful collection of languages next week. I do look forward to speaking with you on Friday, and I hope you are finding the material interesting. Bye for now.